to another Star Mini Gaming YouTube video, uh, and this is kind of the introductory video, I suppose, um, for the series I talked about in my channel update, uh, where I really want to cover the art of war um, and talk about how to apply the principles of it to tabletop gaming. Right? Like, like I said before, you know, the principles can really be applied to any kind of competitive atmosphere. Um, but this is a YouTube channel focused on uh, wargaming, miniature wargaming, and um, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna focus on that um, that here. And I wanted to begin with a quote from the book that I think is the most important concept if you're only going to walk away with one concept from the entire book. Um, and here it is. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, dig down, camp on that thought, that concept, and talk about it within Age of Sigmar. Um, you know, it's it's pretty simple. It's the it's really the quote is just talking about knowing yourself and knowing your opponent, and that takes really two forms in tabletop gaming, right? There's the one that's I would say the easier because it doesn't change, um, and that's literally knowing your units and what they can do and what they're good at, and knowing your opponent's units and what they're good at and what they can do, what they're weak at. Um, and certainly knowing your own units, what they're weak at, that's perhaps even more important. Um, and then knowing yourself, how you like to play, um, what your tendencies are in a game. Everyone has a play style. I've talked about it in uh, my Tactica Tuesday video, um, talking about tempo in wargaming. Um, I know Paul Conti's talked about it before, and I'm sure others have as well uh, within the Warhammer YouTuber community, that um, in games we all have tendencies that we we go towards right if you watch Paul's I believe it's uh, oh I'm sorry Paul I'm gonna butcher the name of it but something to the effect of you know the simple seven or something like that the safe seven in which he talks about you know like his particular stratagems that he is most comfortable with and he employs most often um, in his tabletop war games and how he builds his forces and all to be very uh, what he calls and what's often called in card games a mid-range strategy where you are uh, it's a very balanced approach you're more of a reactionary kind of force now you're not you're not solely a counter puncher but um, but you often look for what your opponent's doing and then react to it as opposed to setting the tempo setting the pace trying to direct the way that the battle is going now that's not to say that you never do that as a kind of mid-rangey player, counterpuncher player. Um, but that's, you know, that's the most common tendency uh, is to is to react. Um, so that's you know knowing yourself, and then if you have the opportunity, if it's someone you've played against quite a bit, um, then knowing your opponent and how they play, um, you know. I've put up the, the few videos, um, I haven't put up any more yet because we haven't had a chance to continue it, but in the uh, narrative campaign that I've been running with my friend Henry, and honestly I've played with Henry in tabletop war games for about 16 years. Like we have, we started at about the same time and we have played almost every war game together throughout the years. Um, and so, you know, we know each other quite well in our style of play. Um, I like to think, whether or not it's true, that I can vary quite comfortably and quite easily the strategy that I approach in these games. I try to be a little bit more unpredictable. Um, but I, knew, I do know that, like everyone else, I have a tendency towards a specific play style. Um, I'm not going to share that on the channel because... Um, some of you I might end up playing against, like Tom, um, you know, Vince's co-host. He and I have been, you know, kind of lightheartedly trash-talking 
uh, for our hopeful eventual game. So, Tom, I'm not going to give away how I play too much. Uh, I don't want I don't want you to have better knowledge of me than I have of you. Um, but that being said, in all seriousness, I know how he plays, and so um, even if I don't know the particular models that he will bring to the table, of course I'll have some idea because I know his collection. Uh, you know, mostly he may have gotten something new that I'm uh, unaware of since you know the last time I played or whatever, and vice versa. But we both largely know what models are you know the other one has available. We both know largely the way that our opponent likes to play, um, and so you know taking that data, that knowledge into into the games, um, you know, is I believe the most important thing I can do to help myself win. Right? I need to. I need to know what are my tendencies in game and what are my opponent's t tendencies within game because you know if I don't pay attention to potential weaknesses in my own game um, then opponents can exploit that right if you're if you are too counter um, you know if you're too prone to sitting back and waiting for your opponent to do something and then you react if that's strictly how you play unless you really make a conscious effort to do otherwise then you know then you can fall too far behind in terms of the mission objective or you know perhaps something that your some plan that your opponent was setting into place um, by moving units around the battlefield uh, perhaps you don't see the consequence of it for too late until it's too late um, because you've been setting back right so knowing your own tendencies as well as, as your opponents you know, in terms of your play style is, is important, but that's not something that we can always do. Um, but fortunately for all of us, we can all practice this discipline of war, if you will, by looking at the app, right? Obviously there's tons and tons of war scrolls. Um, you know, if you were to look at every single model for every single army, including the armies that aren't produced anymore, or like the Tomb Kings or Britonia, um, that's a lot to memorize and clearly you know I'm not gonna say it's impossible but it would it would be very rare that someone would actually be able to truly memorize this is what every war scroll can do and this is what you know this is their strengths this is their weaknesses here's their full stat line to memorize that for everything I'm gonna say it's nearly impossible very few people would ever be able to accomplish that even if a lot of people put their minds to doing so. However, it's much more simple to, number one, if you do know which army your opponent will be playing, even if you've never played against them before, perhaps at a local tournament, then you can study up on, okay, this is Nurgle's faction, here's the units for that, and here's what they all do. And so even if you don't have everything, you know, down pat, you're going to have a pretty good idea of what the army can do and what you're going up against. And that's really true even if you don't know what your opponent's army will be. Um, it's not too difficult to take some time, and I don't think it even takes that much, and just look over the different war scrolls for different armies because I think GW's done a pretty good job of making armies have a certain play style or a play style in which they most excel in. And so if you look at that like let's take Nurgle again for example, most of that stuff in the Nurgle army you know is going, if you've studied the War Scrolls, is going to be pretty difficult to kill because it's going to have either the ability to regen or the ability to just shrug off wounds or mortal wounds with some kind of special alternate save um, or perhaps both, like the Greater Unclean one. Um, and knowing pretty well what things like the greater and clean ones, the bloodthirsters, you know, those like top tier models for each faction, having a pretty good idea of those, even if, again, if it's not perfectly memorized is typically a good idea. Uh, models that you're, you know, models that you believe you're likely to come across often, it's a good idea to know them pretty well. Again, doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I oftentimes when I'm playing an opponent um, and I have and they are setting down their army uh, across from me. I'll oftentimes have the actual book uh, on hand. I don't have it in front of me, but um, such as like the Death Faction book, 
that I'll be looking at for my own army. And whenever I see him placing down his units um, on the table or, you know, off to the side of reserves or whatever, I will often take out my app on my phone or on a tablet or whatever I happen to have handy and put all of his units into the kind of like battle option. Um, and then I can flip through them uh, or look at them throughout the game to determine, um, you know, what can they really do and to have a good knowledge of it. Um, I know not everyone does that. Not everyone necessarily has the ability to do that on the fly, but it's uh, honestly, it's a huge advantage in the game to know, you know, on demand what this oppose, opponent's unit is capable of. And sure, you won't spot every, you won't necessarily spot every combination that they can pull off immediately. Um, in the most recent demo game I ran, there's a perfect example of that. I had my Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, Lady Senessa, um, nearly killed. Honestly, up until this point, every game I've used her in, she's ended the game at perfect health or a wound or two off from it. Um, but in this particular game, uh, I charged her into what I thought would be a relatively easy kill, um, a unit of about 25-ish Saurus Warriors, um, and they were within range of a uh, Old Blood on Carnosaur, or I'm sorry, Scar Veteran on Carnosaur, I believe it was, and um, that commander gave them the ability on a roll of a six with each attack that they made, they could generate an additional attack. Um, and that's those additional attacks could also generate additional attacks and then because they were a squad size of 20 or more they got plus one to their to hit rolls so they were generating extra attacks on a five up so a third of the time um, and even though Lady Senessa had taken the vampiric shield and had cast mystic shield on herself so she was sitting at a two up save um, none of these attacks that she was facing had rend she very nearly died uh, in one round of fighting she went from the full i believe it's 14 wounds on the model um down to five only because she had the blood chalice and she managed to kill a couple enemies in that combat uh only because of that did she not die in the entire game because as that combat went on sure she killed quite a few each round um just with the sheer offensive power of that model um, but, uh, you know, only because of that healing did she not die. She ended the game with something like six or seven wounds, um, left. You know, my opponent w brought Stormcast as well from the starter set, except for the commanders, um, and had, uh, Temple, or Saurus Guard, as they're now called, and some other groups of Saurus Warriors and all. Um, you know, again, this was just a kind of a demo game, but, you know, I didn't know my opponent's army well enough in terms of that combination. I hadn't looked at the command ability of the Scar Veteran because the two times that I've played Lizardmen in the distant past, I brought the Slawn Mage Priest, and I believe he was my commander in every game. Um, but... You know, the power of the combination of that commander with that size squad in that moment, had I, you know, done as Sun Tzu said, and actually taken the time to study my opponent's army and to know my opponent's models better, um, I certainly wouldn't have charged my commander headlong into that group with as little support as I did. I ended up having to throw in um, a unit of six spirit hosts and my coven throne to kind of crush that enemy squad or the enemy squads that's surrounded because a group of liberators or a group of decimators um, and a second smaller group of Saurus warriors all were also converging on her um, pretty quickly and uh, again you know if I'd known how powerful that combination would have been of those abilities then I definitely would not have charged her in but you know that's just that's just to illustrate how not knowing your opponent's troops capabilities can come back to bite you. There's been other times where, um, again, playing against Henry, the, you know, my friend who's in the narrative campaign with me, um, there was a turn where his commanders, um, of the corn bloodbound from the starter set. So we had, you know, the blood stoker, the blood secretor and the mighty Lord of corn were all placed close to each other. Um, and I looked at, you know, I looked at their stats and, 
did a rough calculation. You know, I didn't do a perfect one, didn't have my calculator out or anything, but a rough estimation um, based upon their wounds that they had taken, you know, how many they had left, what their saves were and all, the likelihood of my full health vampire lord on zombie dragon being able to charge in and kill all three of them or at least two of them in a single turn and I deemed it you know a good enough chances of success that I did charge in and I you know actually there was abnormally positive dice rolls um, in my favor I'm not saying you know statistically as if it would never happen but just beyond the you know kind of the average of the mean uh, of what I expected and um, and so I did manage to kill all three of those commanders in a single turn but you know the reason that I chose to go ahead with that plan was because I had I knew what my unit was capable of and I knew what my opponent's units were capable of um, and like I like I said before there is I believe no greater single concept that you know from a tactical standpoint that you can apply to your games um, with greater greater effect of terms of winning and losing than knowing what your opponent's units are capable of and knowing what yours are and are not as well. Um, because if you're fighting Scarbrand, as the example I often use, then you know you're not necessarily wanting to charge your commander in to fight him when he's at full health and wasn't in combat the previous turn. Unless you want your commander to just be obliterated in that round. Um, because almost any other outcome is highly unlikely unless your commander is Nagash or Archaon. Um, something on that level. But, you know, maybe feeding him a small group of five or ten zombies or skeletons. And then charging in with your commander in the next turn. Um is perhaps preferable so that he's weaker and you can get that first really heavy punch in. Again, I'm not saying that's necessarily the go-to move in every instance, but it's important to know, you know, to have the knowledge of this is what they're capable of or else you might have lost your commander when there was no need or you might not have taken out Scarbrand whenever you perhaps had a really likely chance of doing so. Uh, but that's going to go ahead and cut, I'm going to go ahead and cut this one to an end. Um, you know, this little, I guess, prologue, if you will, or introduction um, to the concepts of the art of war in tabletop gaming. Uh, so until next time, this is James, and happy gaming.